Hey, welcome to the College Church Podcast. We're in the middle of a series entitled Fresh Start. We know that trusting God and having courage to step out can sometimes be difficult. The sense of fear and uncertainty can be overwhelming. But we believe that if Jesus is calling us, we can trust that he'll go alongside us. So let's go to Pastor Kevin for today's message. Um, I just want to tell you, number one, it's always good to see you um, online. Great to have you with us as well. I ran into um, a lady right over here this morning who said, it's my first time back in about a year and a half. And um, man, it's just good to be with you. And I'm thankful for each of you and the opportunity, right? Because that's what it is. It's an opportunity that we get to come together and we get to worship. So you may notice today um, the lower candle there is lit, right? Isn't that that good, right? Now that's not a very, um, so maybe you don't know what that means. I'm gonna give you a little bit of grace here. What that means is, right, when we light the lower candle, it means someone has started a relationship with Jesus this week, right? There we go, there we go. Much better. If the Chiefs scored a touchdown, I think we'd be even louder, right? So um, we just want to make sure we're balanced out. But here's what I want to tell you, right? Here's my hope for College Church, is that we get to light that candle over and over and over and over, that we would just be lit all the time, because that we would be a church that is leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus. That's why we're here, right? That's right. And so... um, Man, you're gonna hear me probably say that over and over, um, not because I just picked it up somewhere, but it's because who I am. And, um, and that's what my heart beats for. And, uh, and my hope is that that is really what our church heart beats for. So I, I'm excited to share with you today. Last week, we talked about relationships. If you remember, if you weren't here, that's okay. Um, we talked about our relationship with God. We talked about our relationship with each other and the significance of that. Many folks took steps to either uh, become a part of an ABSF group, maybe they've been out for a while, or to join a a life group, maybe they hadn't done that in a while. And I'm just hearing more and more reports of folks who are saying, I recognize that I need people in my life to help me to move forward spiritually. So I'm I'm grateful for that as well. Hey, um, we're gonna take a look today, Colossians chapter three, Colossians chapter three, we'll start at verse 10, okay? And, um, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit out of the New Testament. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit out of the Old Testament. And I'm just gonna kind of give you a little forewarning, okay? Um, as I prepared, before this service, I like to go in this little prayer room over here. You go through those doors, right? Maybe you didn't even know it was over there. And I just like to, man, take a moment and say, Lord, as I get ready to enter this room, I trust that you have prepared something for our people today. So help me, help me. Would you just sort through my words, take out what you wanna take out, help me to add what you want me to add. But I pray that you would speak to your people. And today, as I was in there praying, I thought to myself, um, the topic today is a little heavy, just just so you know. Not all of it, but there's parts of it that will be a little heavy. But I think heavy is okay. Because sometimes I believe this, that God wants to get into those places that maybe you haven't opened up in a while. Those places that are heavy, that are difficult, that even are painful. And, and the truth is, when we leave them closed off for very long periods of time, healing never happens. But sometimes I think God wants to say, let me in there because I can do a healing that you could never do on your own. And that's what I'm trusting today. Let's read this, this passage together and here's what it says. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Sorry, I just lost my place. There it is. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, 
the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Father, thank you for your word, even when it's difficult. I thank you for it because it challenges us. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just be content with where we are, but that we would lean into you and trust that we can become the people that you've called us to be. That we'd look a little less like ourselves and a little more like you, that we would even be sometimes surprised by the way we respond. That we would see your kind of fruit coming out of our lives amongst the people around us. I ask for your help today. Man, be with us in this place. Communicate with us. I pray that we would hear from you and we would respond to you in Jesus' name, amen. You know, this passage of scripture, I normally don't start on the backside of it, but I'm going to today. And, um, and here's, here's what it says, right? Remember, this is really, really important. Um, how many of you have teenagers? How many times do you say, remember, right? Oh, they forget everything, don't they? Remember, here's what Paul is saying, this group of people, remember the Lord forgave you. The Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. But here's what I want to focus on. So many times, right? That, that sometimes we can rewind many years to where that candle would have been lit for us. Many years ago, right? For some of us. Some of us, maybe not that long ago. For, for many of us, it was many years ago. But may we never take for granted the grace that God extended us. But let's remember it. I mean, remember the day. I mean, God chose to love us. He chose to extend the same kind of things he's asking us, right? This, this mercy, tenderhearted mercy and tenderhearted kindness and patience that was extended to me and to you. He chose to send his son on our behalf for the forgiveness of your sins and my sins that we could be in right relationship with the Father. In 2 Corinthians, it's put this way. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's the truth. You know, even for myself, it's been, um, I think about this, it's been 31 years. Oh, that's hard to believe. 31 years since I came to know Jesus as my personal Savior. I was 16 years old. Um, I was doing some things I shouldn't have been doing, and I walked around with um, a lot of guilt and a lot of shame, right? I grew up in a little Nazarene church, so it wasn't that I didn't know. I just didn't want to know, right? And I was choosing my own path. And I remember it was a Friday night, and I'd, and I'd been out um, that evening, and my, my curfew at that time was midnight. How many of you had like a curfew when you were young, Right? You probably still like, I still got a curfew, right? She still makes me get home at this time. And so I had a curfew and I was supposed to be home by midnight and I was driving home and I don't, I, I really don't, I don't remember the specifics of that evening, but I remember when I was driving home that I was just overwhelmed with this guilt. Truth is, at that time, I didn't really recognize it, but it was the Holy Spirit who was continuing to remind me, right? That he loved me, that he wanted a relationship with me, that there was another way I could live. And, and as, as I came home, I had to go past the Nazarene church where I went to church every time on the way home. It was on the highway leading out to the country where, where I grew up. And that night I went around the curves and I came and I came right around that final curve and I looked off to my right. It was close to midnight. I mean, I always timed it just right, right? It was close to midnight and I looked off to the right and I noticed that the corner room in the building of the church, it had these like rectangular windows and the lights were on. I knew what room that was. I knew it was the pastor's office. I mean, I'd grown up in that church. And as I zipped by that church going way too fast, I, I just knew in my heart something needed to be different. And so I went on down the road a little bit. I turned around in a little veterinary clinic and I drove back and I pulled in the parking lot and I walked up to the door and I knocked on it about midnight. And the pastor opened the door and he's like, well, hey, Kevin, his name was Pastor Mike Ice. Cool as ice, right? And he welcomed me in and I sat across the table from him and he was like, what are you doing out this late? And I began to share with him and I just said, man, I'm at a place where like I need a change. 
And he walked me right through. In fact, he showed me a picture where Jesus was knocking on the door. And he reminded me that Jesus was knocking on the door of my heart. And he led me in a prayer right there in that office. And when I left that office that night, I felt new. Right? It was the first night that I was late that I really didn't get in trouble. Right? (laughs) I had a really good excuse to be late that night. And then, and then fast forward, like just a, a really cool part of that story. Fast forward, probably 15 years later, I would go back and I would pastor at that church and I would write sermons in that very office. Who would have thought, right? And I would lead, the Lord would lead through me and through that church, a whole lot of other people to pray the same prayer that I prayed in that office. It's part of what, like, it's part of my story. It's part of why that candle excites me so much because I know what it's like to walk around with that heavy feeling of not, not being in right relationship, and I know what it feels like to be right in that relationship. May you remember. I mean, sometimes it's good just to go back and remember. Remember your story. You can probably remember where you were. You can remember like the details of it. It's significant, right? But see, then what I'm thankful for is that when I was 16 and I prayed that prayer, it didn't just stop there. Like, I'm not the same person I was then. I'm a very different person now because God has continued to shape and form me over the last 31 years. There came a point when I was 17 when I remember walking down to that aisle, walking down the aisle, and I remember bowing there and praying at an altar right there in my church and just saying, Lord, like, I don't know what more you want from me, but you can have all of me. And if you want to do something through me, I'm willing And that's when I figured out, right, like a month or two later, that I was gonna be doing what I'm doing today. I look back at that, right? In fact, even this passage of scripture in verse 10 says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. There's this renewing that continues to happen in us when our relationship with God is continuing to form and develop when we're continuing to come before him every day and say, God, like, just do something today in me. I found myself driving into town just this last week and I was going to this place and I was gonna run into some folks and I knew it and I was just like, Lord, today, like, however you wanna do this, I'm willing. If, if a conversation could, could happen, I'm willing. I think that's where he wants us to be. That the big goal, right, would be that we would continue to stay under, to recognize we are the created, he is the creator. Renew me and help me to look more like you. That should be every one of our goals. The process should never stop. I hope that I look a whole lot more like him than I did when I was 16, right? And then you move move on through this passage. Verse 12 says this, since God chose you to be holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves. There's a whole lot we could do that. We could probably do a series on that. But clothe yourselves with tender-hearted things like mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Even the word tender-hearted caught my attention. I don't know about you, but even when I think about those things, like extending mercy and kindness, like clothing myself, putting on those things, that I'm gonna walk around, right, extending mercy and kindness and patience, You don't do that when you're hard-hearted. Like that requires tender-heartedness. It requires a soft heart towards Jesus that those things would flow in us and through us. And and, and here's what I'm gonna tell you. We talked about it last week, but relationships are complex. Our relationships are complex. And it doesn't take much, does it, to receive an injury and for a relationship to go south south. In fact, um, we're probably set up for more injuries than we have been in a long time. And I say that because, number one, like, man, the culture we live in right now, people are on edge. I don't know about you, it didn't take much to set some folks off. Have you figured that out lately? It didn't take much. And you have to be really careful what you say. You have to be careful how you engage with people because, man, people are ready for a fight. Just, just go out for lunch today and say, hey, can we talk about politics? See what happens, <laughs> right? And, and I'll tell you this. I mean, it just doesn't take much. It's like there's gasoline all over the, all over the pavement. One spark, ba-boom. 
And then we live in a culture where here, here's, here's opposite of the Jesus culture, right? Instead of working through that relationship, what do we do? I'm done with you, right? You think differently than me? You wanna argue with me? I'm done with you. We cut people off like we're cutting someone off on the highway and we move on. And I don't see that in the book. I don't see that that's the way that Jesus has called us to live. I think he wants us to try to get in these relationships, even when they're complex and hard, and, and actually try to work some things out, to try to figure out how we could get along, to try to figure out maybe how Jesus would respond versus the way that we want to respond. It's hard, I know it. You know, you think about this, we have no margin. Most of us have no margin in our life, which also creates like, we, it, it, we're on edge. We communicate less and less face-to-face. -face. We communicate more here. And it's so easy to misinterpret, isn't it? I mean, you just, you just go down the list. It doesn't take, take much. Something small happens in the midst of a relationship. And the next thing we know, it takes root and it begins to grow. And we turn around one day and all of a sudden, something has become big. And, and I've seen this. I've seen it in my own life. That at times, something becomes big and I can't even remember where it started when it was small. You, you know what I'm talking about? You're like, I don't know where it happened, but man, we're just with Joe, we are off. Oh, there was something. There was something small that took root and now it's big. Many of us, we could speak of relationships in that way. I remember when something really small in my life turned into something big. I'm actually kind of embarrassed to even talk about it, but, but the truth is, when I, was, when I was writing this message, it's the story that came to mind. You know, I, I remember when I was actually at, at college church years ago. I was a young pastor. I was learning how to be a pastor. I, I really, like, everything was brand new. I was green as could be, and I was just trying, right? And, and there was this altar response, and, and, and my pastor at the time, Pastor Boone, had asked all the pastors to come up and to pray with people. And, and I was up there and we were supposed to kind of anoint people and pray this prayer over them. And so I was kind of manning my area and all of a sudden I saw this professor who I'd had in, in college and I'd kind of looked up to and they were walking towards that altar and I thought, no, 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 no. Like go a different direction. Send him right, send him left. Don't send him here, right? And sure enough, he came and he knelt right in front of me and I felt everything inside of me get a little tense and get nervous. And I thought, I, I, I don't want to pray for him. Not because I didn't like him, but because I felt very intimidated. And I, would, I thought, this is just, I'm not like, mm, I can't do this. And as, as he knelt, I thought, I mean, I looked around and everybody else was probably like, oh boy. So I went over, right? And I laid my hand on his shoulder and I began to pray for him. And, I, and I'll be honest, I mean, it was not a beautiful prayer. I struggled through it. I wrestled through it. And I struggled to find my words. But I'll tell you what happened. At the end of that prayer, I said, amen. And I stepped back and I was like, Phew. And, and, you know, and I saw him walk up and he kind of moved over a little bit and he knelt again and he looked at the other pastor. He said, would you pray for me again? Now you laugh, right? I can laugh now. But at the time, I wanted to go crawl underneath the backside of the altar, Right? It absolutely leveled me that as this young kid and this professor who was formative in my thinking, and then uh, the only message I could receive was is that I wasn't enough. And I'll tell you, like I left that day and I wrestled with it and the next day and the next day and the next year and the next year. And, and I found myself like years down the road remembering that story all too clearly. You know what I'm talking about? There are times where injuries happen and we can tell you the details of those stories because it hurt, because it hurt. And what happens is it takes hold and we begin to leave, believe the lies that are associated with the injury. I know, what the, I know what this book says about who I am. I know where my value comes from. I didn't need my value to come from him. I can tell you that today, but as a young kid, I couldn't. And it, and it shaped me and it molded me in ways in which were not good. And so I've, I've, had to, I've had to work through that. You'd even be surprised even coming to college church, it reminded me of it. Yeah, you think that's funny, right? 
But see, then the next part of the scripture, listen to this. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. And remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. See, even for me, right? Like, make allowance for each other's faults. Like, he was having a bad day too, right? And the prayer was bad. I get it. But make allowance. And then, and then what's this say? Forgive anyone who offends you. Let it go. Don't hang on to it. Let it go. Forgive. Why? Because we remember how he forgave us. We remember how offensive our life was to him. And the same one who extended grace and the same one who forgave us in those moments when we needed it most has asked us to forgive others. There's a quote that I read this week. It says, God's word is powerfully effective to cut through all my justifications to stay mad, to prove my case, to wallow in unforgiveness and handle things in my flesh. It is possible to live a different way. Forgiveness doesn't excuse them. Forgiveness doesn't excuse what happened. Forgiveness doesn't excuse the one who injured you. But I'll tell you this, it does free you from allowing them to continue to cause you more pain day after day after day. That you can let it go. Forgiveness doesn't excuse them or make light of it but it can stop it. And then you're like, Kevin, do you really just let them off the hook? I mean, that's so much easier said than done. I mean, what about justice? Well, see, just because we forgive someone doesn't mean they don't face consequences. If you think about the way God forgives us, he oftentimes still allows us to feel the consequences of our sin. And here's what I would tell you. I think it's important. God isn't soft on evil. God is just but there are consequences to our actions on both earth, like in both earth and in heaven. You know, um, forgiveness is the most unfair command that God asks of us. But I think it's important to remember who's asking it. That he's the God of compassion and he's the God of comfort who sees our wounds and knows the deep injuries. He knows the hurts. And the truth is, what if forgiveness was less about the other individual and the reason that God commands it is because it's more about you. That he wants you to be healed and whole. That he doesn't want, want you to walk around believing these, these bad narratives. But he wants you to hear what he has to say about you. You know, um, there's a story in the Old Testament. I was thinking about this message and. And there's a story in the Old Testament, and many of you may know it. There's a story about uh, twins named G Jacob and Esau. They were twin boys in the Old Testament, and they had a very interesting story. They were very different. And um, if you don't know it, check it out this week in the book of Genesis. But the story is a story of deep betrayal, where the younger brother manipulates and steals from the older brother, and it gets ugly. How many of you remember the story? Mm-hmm, Good. And Jacob didn't just cheat his brother once. He cheated him twice. In fact, here's what it says in Genesis 27, 40, 41. From that time on, Esau hated Jacob because their father had given Jacob the blessing and Esau began to scheme. I will soon be mourning my father's death and then, right, you can almost hear it, and then I will kill my brother, Jacob. This is how lifetime movies happen right here, right? These kinds of stories. Somebody did somebody wrong a long time ago. And then, and then this thing raises up within us, right? Rebecca hears of Esau's plans and she goes and tells Jacob. She packs him up a suitcase and says, you gotta get out of here, Jacob, because bad things are getting ready to happen. Fast forward many years later, Jacob has been away from home for 20 years. 20 years later, the Lord says to Jacob in Genesis 31, Go home and see your family. I will be with you. Things weren't really going well where he was at anyway, so he loaded up the family and he left for home. But now, 20 years later, right, he's thinking about what's it gonna mean when I go home? 
He sends his messengers ahead, um, really, to go do some spying and some scouting on his brother Esau. And he says, hey, I need you to go ahead and I need you to give greetings to Esau. And when you see him, to say, hey, I'm bringing you greetings from your servant, Jacob. (laughs) He's trying to enter this the right way, right? Tell him that I've been living with Uncle Laban. I've accumulated much. I mean, I've got donkeys, I've got cattle, I've got sheep, I've got goats, I've got male and female servants. And I'm sitting this greeting ahead of time in hopes that you'll be friendly to me. He's really saying, I'm hoping, right, that you're not gonna like take my life. So the messengers return, they go out, right? They go looking for Esau and and they go and they return and here's the report back. They say, hey, we found him. We found him, we brought him greetings and we, we saw him and by the way, he had 400 men with him and he was already coming to see you. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Jacob, I'm going, huh, wonder why he has 400 men, right? This doesn't sound good. And so what happens is Jacob says, oh boy, this doesn't sound good. He divides his group in half and he sends one over here because he doesn't want to get all wiped out in one day. He begins to divide his flocks um, into groups and he puts servants with them. And he's like, hey, I'm going to send you all ahead and you're going to kind of, you're going to kind of come in groups, right? So then when Esau sees you coming and he's like, hey, what's all this? You say, hey, this is all Jacob's, right? And this is his gift to you. I mean, he's trying to butter him up. And so fast forward after a long night of wrestling with God, Jacob looks up and he sees Esau coming with his 400 men. He puts his servant wives and children first, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph bring up the rear. Poor Leah, right? He goes on ahead and then it says he bows down seven times. I mean, you talk about trying to go in humbly. He bows down seven times and then I love this Genesis 33, verse four, then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And they both wept. Isn't that just a beautiful picture? Now, hang with me. Jacob carried that weight for 20 years. You got to know this, Jacob, this wasn't the first time, like, hey, go back home. This wasn't the first time that Jacob was probably thinking, Esau could show up at my doorstep. He had carried this for 20 years. Can you imagine that moment when Esau is running towards him, right? And and imagine when he's throwing his arms out, is is, is he going to do this or is he going to do this? And when he embraces Jacob, can you imagine the relief in Jacob's heart, the weight that he must have been carrying. And then you have Esau. He's waited 20 years for this moment as well. 20 years. I can guarantee you the first few years, it was not going to be this. It was going to be this. But somewhere along the line, something changed from this to this. It's a beautiful picture. You know, um, I can only assume that he'd let it go a long time ago. See, Jacob expected to find hurt and he expected to find someone who was bitter. Instead, he found healed and someone who was better. Not because of what he, what he had done, because of what God had done. Some of us today were carrying the weight of causing an injury to someone else. And my guess is we probably need to go and take care of it, do our part to seek forgiveness. We've played it over and over in our minds. Things have held us back like fear or pride. The truth is you can only do your part. I can't tell you how the person will respond. You can only do your part. Others, you're wrestling with someone in your heart and mind who has injured you. You know, it's your choice. You can carry that for 20 years if you want. Maybe you already have. You can allow it to make you bitter You can ask God to heal your heart, make you better. God knows how to comfort you. He can help you let it go. My my prayer this morning is that we would make space for God to do what he wants to do in your heart today. You know, um, I think about a message like this, and here's, here's my guess. 
that for some of you, I mean, even as I tell a story that happened to me, there's someone that comes to mind for you. You know, here's, here's this fact of it. it. Usually it's not hard. If it's there, it's not hard for it to come to the surface. Because sometimes even injuries that were a long time ago, they're just barely below the surface. It's where they live. The truth is they haven't gone away. It's, it's still there and it still defines us and it still bothers us. It still continues to injure us because we haven't let it go. Let, let, let me just tell you something. Um, when I think about the individual who I don't think intentionally hurt me, my guess is they did not think about that another day. I carried it for years. I wasn't doing them harm in carrying it. I was just harming myself. What I want for you and what I believe God wants for you is to be able to unload your heart to him. You weren't meant to carry those things. You were meant to bring it to him and say, Whew, Father, just as you forgave me, I can forgive them. Now, let me, let me tell you something. Even if, that, if, if you were to walk today and say, man, I'm dropping them off, right? I'm not saying you won't still think about it tomorrow, but let me just tell you something. The healing process has to start somewhere. And my guess is when it comes up, you just continue to do that. God, here they are. I give them to you again because I don't want to carry it anymore. There's not another thing I can do. I remember when I was younger and I was in a service, I was like a young kid and a special, um, we had like special services at the church and this pastor was preaching. He preached a message very similar to this. I will never forget it. And at the end, he invited people to come and to, I mean, receive forgiveness, extend forgiveness. He even said, which oh, as a kid in a small church, you know, you know all the stories. And he said, hey, if, if you need to walk across the room today and go talk to someone, go walk across the room and talk to them. And I remember thinking like, you know, when, you know when they say to bow your heads, and I'm like, because <laughs> I want to watch this happen. And sure enough, people were walking across the room. People were embracing each other. I mean, I, you know, and it's so interesting, right? As a kid, that's a picture I will never, ever forget. Because that's not how the world operates, but that's how the kingdom operates. That's what he has called us to. I'm going to ask Michael to come. We're going to sing a song. And... Um, I, I was thinking about what song we might sing at the end of the service today. And this song really, it's, it's more thinking about this deep love that has been extended us. I don't know about you, but when I just reflect on, when I go back to the very first thing we talked about, remember, the Lord forgave you. See, like if that is what I'm focused on and that is what I see and that is what I remember, it changes how I see others. It, it softens my heart. And when I recognize the grace that has been extended to me, it opens me to extend grace to others. I don't know what you need to do today. Maybe there's someone in the room, you need to walk over and visit with them. Maybe it's this afternoon, you need to make a phone call. You need to go visit somebody. Or maybe it's just for your own sake, you need to come and you need to say, God, I'm bringing them. It's an injury that was last month or 14 years ago. I'm bringing them and I'm dropping them off and I'm gonna let them go because it's not doing me any good and I need to be healed. I don't wanna be bitter. I wanna be better. So as we sing this song, these altars are open. You can pray at your seats. You can pray up here. You can go and see if someone if you need to. I just want to make space for you to be able to respond. Hey, if this message was encouraging to you and you'd like to learn more information about what it means to begin a relationship with Jesus, to get involved in a group, or you're ready to be baptized, you can go to collegechurch.com slash hello to let us know.